All right, it's a blessing to see each of you tonight in the service and to support this conference. I'm very thankful tonight for salvation. I'm very thankful that God saved me 43 years ago. I was, uh, and, uh, and changed my life and changed my direction. I'm so thankful tonight for Christ, uh, the Son of God, who came at the bidding of the Father, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Amen. And I'm thankful that He did. Amen. I'm thankful for all His blessings tonight. Amen. I'm not unworthy of His blessings, even as a saved person, but I'm very thankful for His blessings. Amen. I'm 66 years old, and um, these days, Psalm 37 4 is one of my favorite verses. Delight thyself also in the Lord. And he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And that's certainly been true in my life. And uh, as best as I knew how, I've always delighted in the Lord. I do delight in the Lord. I see his handiwork everywhere. And, uh, and I have the privilege to walk with him and to talk with him. And he has given me the desires of mine heart. In every way uh, in my life, I can testify in that. I'm thankful for the family that he's given me. The wife he gave me, I'm very unworthy of her, and uh, I tricked her, see. But uh, I'm so thankful for her. She's a godly woman. She has meant so much to my life and to my ministry. She's in Nepal tonight. But I'm very thankful for her, for our four children, and for our eight grandchildren. It's been said that if, uh, uh, one grandfather said if he knew how, what a blessing grandchildren were, he would have had them first. But I'm very thankful for my family. I'm very thankful tonight for the ministry that God gave me. I'm unworthy of that. Uh, God called me to preach. Soon after I was saved, he called me to write. <clears throat> I wrote my first book and printed my first book uh, the first year that I was saved. And I began, uh, I had that burden from the very beginning, I never sat down and planned to write anything. It's as God was showing me things, as God was teaching me things, and all the exciting things I began to learn from His Word. After I got saved, I just I desired to teach that and, 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 and to teach it in every way. To teach it uh, with my mouth, but also to teach it with my pen. <clears throat> and I'm very thankful tonight for all of His blessings. We're thankful for the visitors tonight, even those that are late. And uh, we appreciate you coming. <laughs> you know, Nepalis, I, I'm a missionary in Nepal, and uh, they're always late. So I feel right at home <laughs> with you guys. And you probably drove a long distance. Would you look with me tonight at 2 Timothy? Very thankful for each of you preachers that have come out tonight. And 2 Timothy... Chapter 4 is addressed to preachers. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own uh, lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Preach the word. And here in the context of preaching the word, and we're told how to preach the word. We're to preach the word uh, with reproof and with rebuke and with exhortation and with long suffering and uh, in doctrine but right in the context of the command to preach the Word of God and the strong warning that we're, we're standing before God, we're going to be held accountable to God, I charge thee, therefore, before God, Paul said to Timothy, right in the context of this is the warning about the coming of apostasy. And so a, a good preacher is going to give warnings about this kind of thing. That's 2,000 years old. But the situation today is much, much worse than it was then. 
And this apostasy has come upon us. This apostasy is 2,000 years old. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church was a part of it as it formed gradually for over the first few hundred years. And all the different uh, uh, things that have come out of it, like the Greek Orthodox Church and all the cults and whatnot. But the Bible indicates to us that at the end of the age, there's going to be an explosion of apostasy. Well, that's what we see. And the pastor was asking uh, last night, what is the short definition for the emerging church? Well, in time apostasy. And it takes all kinds of forms. Right. Amen. The devil has something for everyone. And so a preacher that doesn't give warnings about this apostasy is not doing his job. And that means he has to be prepared to give warnings about apostasy. And that means he has to know something. And, uh, and so that's what we want to deal with tonight. We've the, the, the theme overall of the conference has been the Trojan horse entering into the independent Baptist churches, fundamental Baptist churches. We've dealt with many things uh, since Sunday. We dealt last night with youth discipleship. A great passion on my heart is, is the next generation. Since I had grandkids, more than ever, I've had a great burden, a great dis uh, a passion about uh, a a winning and discipling the next generation. I'm so concerned about that. Most of the materials I've been producing these days have been geared toward that, such as the, the new course, the mobile phone, and the Christian home and church. How to win and disciple young people in the midst of the smartphone generation, which is devouring young people. And, uh, uh, and so that is a great passion, but that's not the subject tonight. The subject tonight is emerging church and how rapidly fundamental Baptists are moving in that direction. And so I want to take you tonight in this first session to a conference I attended. The Lord uh, began to teach me to do serious research when I was the first 10 years of our missionary work in Nepal. That was 79 to 89. My wife and I had the privilege of starting the first Baptist church in the country of Nepal in those days. And that is, continues to be a self-supporting uh, church, self-propagating church. That church has started a couple dozen churches since we left in 89. In those years, I started Old Timothy Magazine, primarily for preachers in India and Nepal, in that part of the world. And the Lord showed me that I really had to have my facts right that if I was going to uh, uh, be speaking about something or even be warning about something, it, it was very necessary that I had my facts right. And I began to do first-hand research into things. And so if I was talking about evangelicalism, uh, I subscribe to Christianity Today and all these, uh, uh, these magazines that I have no respect for, but for the whole purpose of learning and warning and having all my facts right. And that's what I do these days with the emerging church in the last several years. And one piece of research that I did to understand the emerging church, to help us not go in the direction of the emerging church, is I attended a conference with media credentials. And those are very interesting. This one was in San Diego in February 2009. How time flies. And, uh, but it was sponsored by Zondervan and InterVarsity Press, two of the most prominent and influential presses. And, uh, and their authors of these uh, presses represent the mainstream of evangelicalism today. Welcome to the 2009 National Pastors Convention. I was there with media credentials. Uh, they didn't know who it was. They made a big mistake. And I got to interview big name, evangelical, Emerging church preachers. There were roughly 1,500 pastors and Christian uh, workers in attendance, mostly pastors. Andy Crouch, senior editor of Christianity Today, was there. Rob Bell, I don't think he still claims to be a Christian, but he did then, was there. Leighton Ford was there, Billy Graham's brother-in-law. I tried to have an interview with him. It was very short. Because I asked him how, well, anyway, it was a short interview. 
Shane Claiborne was there. Brian McLaren was there. One of the biggest names in the emerging church. Bill Hybels was there. Willow Creek Church. But it's all about the emerging church. That was their theme, emerging church. I wanted to learn about the emerging church, so there I was. There's two streams I came to see, I've come to see. There's more of a conservative stream and a more of a liberal stream. Now, from our perspective, they're all liberal. For example, Bill Hybels, Willow Creek, senior pastor, he stood up and he gave a testimony that anyone in this room would accept as authentic testimony of salvation. Sounds like he's actually a saved man. I have serious doubts about that. But just from his testimony, talking about a born-again experience through repentance and faith in Christ. On the other hand, Brian McLaren uh, doesn't really hardly believe anything in the Bible. And he has a, no personal testimony of the new birth. Even though his grandparents and parents, his grandparents were brethren missionaries. But he does not believe that the blood of Christ is necessary for salvation. He does not believe in eternal hell. I'm not quite sure what he does believe. And so you got these two streams. And the emergent church basically is just a new name for a new approach to church work and church life. And uh, it really all it is is new evangelicalism that started back in the 50s. It's just progressed and this is where it is today. And a whole bunch of independent Baptists are new evangelical. And so the result's going to be the same. Since society is changing, they say the church must change. And so this is just basically the latest heresy in the stream of new evangelicalism. Fifty years ago, they rejected biblical separatism and many other things. But this was fundamental. Harold Ockengay, one of the early New Evangelical leaders, he claimed to coin the term. But he said New Evangelicalism is different from fundamentalism. The repudiation of separatism and it's the repudiation of separatism. And it's determination to engage itself in the theological dialogue of the day. Billy Graham our evangelistic association is not concerned to pass judgment, favorable or adverse, on any particular denominational non judgmentalism. We don't judge. Leighton Ford, this was the short interview I had with him. And I, I said to him, Dr. Uh, uh, Ford, you, you've been at the forefront of this evangelicalism for a long time, and your brother in law, and, uh, I said, uh, you know, you've got men here at this conference like Brian McLaren that doesn't even believe in the blood of Christ for salvation. Uh, what, what, are you, what are you doing to warn about these things? And he said, it was a very short interview, I will not criticize anyone. End of interview. Well, that's the, that's, that's the basic heart of new evangelicalism. I won't judge, I won't criticize, I won't separate. And yet the Word of God says that we are to earnestly contend Amen. for the faith once delivered to the saints. Right. We're to fight for it. We're to defend it. We're to stand up for it. The Word of God says, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. If I rub shoulders with men that believe different things and men that believe wrong things and men that are compromising, men that are going in a different direction, uh, that will affect me. Right. And the Word of God says don't be deceived on that one. And because we are deceived about that, we think, well, I can associate with them. I'm strong enough. Nobody's strong enough. Amen. Be not deceived. Good. Evil communications corrupt good manners. That's a fact far-reaching implications. It's a, it's a truth, it's a fact that we have to apply to our lives and ministries all the time and reapply 
as things are changing all the time. The Word of God commands separation. Separation is not a mean thing. Separation is not a hateful thing. Separation is a wall of protection around the truth. Yeah. And the merging church is not a little thing. We are a little thing. That is a big thing in, in the perspective of this world. Willow Creek, that's not just one church. Bill Hybels is over. That's 12,000 right. churches. Right. Whole association. And that's just one of those men, Rick Warren. And uh, I took that picture, went to Saddleback Church one morning, back when Rick used to wear Hawaiian shirts. And uh, that's huge. Those are huge churches. Nothing small about this. They're the ones publishing the influential books. They're the ones that are connecting with people all throughout the internet, mostly. And, uh, but it's a rejection. It's a rejection of what their own fathers believed. One of the books I bought there was Faith of My Fathers. Here, this, the author was a, is a third generation Baptist pastor. A third generation Baptist pastor. And he said, my granddaddy believed these things. Uh, he was Southern Baptist, of course. My granddaddy believed all these doctrinal things. And my dad believed all these things, but I don't believe those things. He doesn't have the faith of his fathers. He's rejected the faith of his fathers. And they are targeting our children and our grandchildren. When I read this in a book by Brian McLaren a few years ago, my ears certainly perked up because I have grandkids. Over time, he said, what they reject, he's talking about fundamentalist, anybody that he would call a fundamentalist, certainly talking about us. But over time, what they reject, what we reject today, we reject him, we reject all this stuff. There's nobody in this room probably that doesn't. He said, what they reject will create a safe space outside their borders out there on the internet. That's what he's really talking about. And become a resource, resource so that many, if not most, of the grandchildren of today's fundamentalists will learn and grow and move on from the misguided battles of their forebears. Right. Well, my battles aren't misguided because they're based on the Word of God. That's right. And whether I win or lose, I win because it's based on the Word of God. That's right. If you stand on the Word of God, you win. It doesn't matter what happens in this present world at this present time, but he's talking about our grandkids. Right. And he says, we're going to win them. And you know what? He's mostly right. Because most independent Baptists are not anywhere near prepared to face this kind of stuff. Right. Not anywhere near it. And he's right for the most part. But not for my part. I'm going to do everything I can that I know is necessary, that's possible to, to keep the next generation that we have. We're church planters. We have churches. In Nepal, when I'm there, and I'm mostly there, this is a three-week trip. I'll be right back there in a week and a half and back into the routine, God willing. And I'll be teaching several hours every week with my Bible college. We have a full-time Bible college with our churches and training and discipling our young people and our men and our families. And, I, and, and I'm going to do everything I can hands-on with our own churches to make sure that that doesn't happen. Amen. And, and to, 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 to cry out to other pastors to do the same thing. Amen. But for the most part, I think he's right. Because I know independent Baptist very well. A Christianity that is comfortable with this world. What is emerging church? It is a Christianity that we're talking about that comfortable with this world. That's, that's the heart and soul of it. All the general sessions there began with a half hour comedy routine. With the comedian, the, 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 the sessions, not with prayer, with a comedy routine. And then a rock concert, a rock concert with smoke and lights and 
a rock concert. A Christianity that's comfortable with this world. Profanity. Will Williman, bishop in the United Methodist Church, spoke. He wasn't much of a preacher, but he spoke. You know, the best preachers I've heard at these ecumenical conferences are black women. <laughs> They're not right, but they can preach at least. But anyway, he's cussing. He's cursing in his message. He's cursing. It's okay. Mark Driscoll has been called the cussing preacher. He says he's sorry for that, but that was his reputation. He said, we're theologically conservative and culturally liberal. Well, this culture is an enemy of a holy God. That's right. That's right. You can't be a friend of this pop culture and call yourself theological conservative because theological conservative would mean you, 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 you honor and obey the Bible, and the Bible doesn't allow you to be culturally liberal. But that's who they are. Heart and soul what they are. That church, that church, uh, he got fired, you know. But, but back when he was one of the big voices in the emerging church, they had champagne dance parties, New Year you, you, the young pe people had to bring their IDs to make sure you, if you could drink or not. Rock and roll dance party, uh, watching R-rated movies, uh, men's meetings, sitting around discussing an R-rated movie. They operated a Paradox Theater, which was a, a secular rock and roll theater for young people. And they got in trouble because the Japanese group came and took their clothes off. Well, what do they expect? Right. That is secular rock and roll. You don't keep your clothes on with secular rock and roll. That's, right. That's what it's all about. And yet the Word of God says, be not conformed to this world. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And the Bible says that if, if we're a friend of the world, then we're the enemy of God. Right. Well, what is emerging church? It's, it's, it's a church, so-called, that is comfortable with the world. How many independent Baptist churches today are comfortable with the world? If I were to try to preach this tonight in a lot of independent Baptist churches, this would be the last service. Without a doubt. It's an ecumenical blending. What is the emergency church? It's ecumenism. Presbyterians and Methodists and Lutherans and Episcopalians and Pentecostals and Mennonites and the United Church of Christ and Roman Catholics. That's who was at this meeting. Just this mixed multitude, all happy together. I was the only one not happy, I think, as far as I could tell when I go to these things. They're all happy together. It's all fine. We're all one. Well, I'm not one with them. But they are. It's, they're all one. It's ecumenism. They all believe that Jesus wants us to be one like that. A Catholic priest was there inter being interviewed. A Catholic priest. And here's the editor of Christianity Today. They're, they were one. A Jewish agnostic was there as one of the speakers. A Jewish, not even a Jewish Jew, a Jewish agnostic. A man who wrote a book depicting God as a woman was one of the speakers. Paul Young, author of The Shack. But we're all one. We're all smiling together. We're all hugging each other. A man who denies the infallibility of the Bible, the substitutionary blood atonement of Christ, denies an eternal fiery hell, denies the literal fall of man, was there, one of the big speakers there, Brian McCurran. There he is while I was interviewing him. Boy, is he a slick one. These guys are chameleons. Right, yeah. All of a sudden, he was a fundamentalist. Right. But he doesn't believe the Bible. What is the emerging church? I'll tell you what the emerging church is. It's, it, it's, a, it's a Christianity that hates biblicist Christianity. They don't, they don't judge anything except one thing, and that's us. Even the comedians made fun of us. Michael Jr. was there. He was one of the comedians. And he was, we was talking about these strict Christians. These strict Christians. 
And he said, he said they're oversaved. And I thought to myself, no, you're undersaved. Yeah. What is the emerging church? Well, it's a magnet for rebels. I understand the emerging church. Because I grew up in a Baptist church, made a profession of faith and wasn't saved. But somehow still wanted some religion along the way. It's a magnet for rebels. Here's, here's an example of that. When we were waiting to interview uh, Brian McLaren, he was late. And there was a young man sitting there in the interview section. His name was Zach Lynn. So we st started to talk to him. And he, he's the drummer. He's a, a drummer for a famous rock group called Jimmy Eat World. And he's sitting there. He's at the conference. He's, he's, he's really loving everything. And so he told us his story. We asked him, are you born again? That's what I ask at this conference. Ask people. He said, I, I grew up in a very conservative Baptist church. Very conservative. But secretly loved rock music and rejected biblical preaching. He said, you know, I was there. I was in the pews. He said it was a church that even preached against rock music. Must have been an independent Baptist church, as far as I could figure. It wasn't a Southern Baptist church. And uh, he said there he was, a secret rock and roll lover, just itching to get out of there, which he did as soon as he could, just like I did, as soon as I could as a, young, as a teenager. As soon as I could get out of church, I got out of church. But this is what he said. He was drawn back to church through the writings of these emerging authors, like Brian McLaren and Rod Bell, too many mentioned, neither one of which whom believe the Bible at all. But he's so powerfully affected by them that he's drawn back to church, not church, but that church. And why is that? Because he doesn't have to give up anything. And we can all understand that. That's a powerful attraction. You don't have to give up your music. Yeah, those people over there would tell you too, but hey, you don't have to do that. Cut your hair. Why should you cut your hair? We like your ponytails and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, really don't have to change all the things you love. People, what do people love? They love the pop culture. Well, you don't have to give that up to go over there. So it's a magnet for rebels. I don't, I don't have to give up my rebellion. You mean I don't have to give up anything? It's kind of like quick prayerism. A church in Maine. Uh, I have a pastor friend in Maine. He told me about this church down the road that had a campaign. They went around the community knocking on doors. And they said, if somebody opened the door, if I could tell you that you can go to heaven when you die, and you don't have to change anything, would you be interested? Well, we know that salvation is a gift, but hey, that's a lie. Because repentance is something. Amen. Yes. That's right, brother. Amen. Yeah, that's a lie, no matter who tells it. In the emerging church, there's liberty to be a Christian and play in a rock band? Sure. They all do. He said the gospel he believed growing up well, the, the gospel of being saved from punishment is not the gospel he believes today. So he, he, he believes a whole different gospel. Yeah. Blue Like Jazz is one of their very popular books. Donald Miller, the author, he, 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 he talks about how he wanted to drink beer and watch raunchy movies and talk trashy and run around with atheists and rebels. That, that was his heart's desire as a young man. And he, he found that in the emerging church. All of that's good. He was at a book signing, and a woman came up and was wanting him to autograph her books, and she said, I'm a Jesus girl, but I also like to go out and do the kiosots with my friends. 
This is a book I can give to those friends. Yeah, let's go out and get drunk together. And by the way, here's a great book about Jesus. Well, it's a false Jesus, but anyway, it's a good book about Jesus. Jazz, jazz, see, jazz never resolves. Kind of just floats around and never resolves. That's, that's the kind of Christianity they're preaching. This is emerging church. Here's another one of their popular books, A Renegade's Guide to God. They're written by a pastor, David Foster. He wants a renegade type of Christianity. That's what I got saved out of. But this is the kind of Christianity he wants. He said in that book, direct quote, we won't be told what to do or commanded how to behave. Hmm. And, and that was me before I was saved. I made two vows. When I got out of the army, I made two foolish vows, both of which I've broken. But I vowed, well, one vow was I'd never wear green again. Hated the army. But the other vow was I'd never cut my hair again. I, I was a rebel. Nobody's going to tell me how to live. Shook my fist at my dad. And then after I got saved, the first thing I did, the, the very next day, was I drove home and walked into the house and I made things right with my dad and I apologized to my dad because I wasn't a renegade anymore. Kind of strange Christianity. Donald McCullough, uh, another of their popular books. If grace is amazing, so amazing, why don't we like it? Isn't that a strange thing to say? But, but he's talking about we want more freedom. We want a different kind of grace. We want here, Oklahoma, I think this was in Oklahoma City, the we, hurt, we hate church church. <laughs> you know, that, that just come over here because we hate church too. It means we hate those old Bible churches. Right. We all hate those old Bible That's whole of America today. All of America hates those old Bible churches. Right. All of America hates the grandfather and, and uh, 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 Christianity that we used to have. They hate it. We hate church. means that kind of church. But that was prophesied in Scripture. We've already read it tonight. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Heaps and heaps of teachers. The old man rebels against God's holiness. Always has, always will. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are, the, are contrary to one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. There, there's a warfare. I faced that same battle in my youth. I was always good looking. <laughs> but I had some serious problems. <laughs> you don't have to laugh that much. And I face, I face that battle because it's the battle of rebellion. It's the battle of who you're going to submit your life to. That's the essence of repentance, I believe, is, is that surrender to God's authority. It's not complicated. But you've got, you, you've got to do that to be saved. God does not accept rebels into the kingdom of God. That would be the same old mess that we've had until now that, that he has a plan to get rid of. No, I've got to bow my knees to God's authority. I've got to surrender to God's authority. And once God's in first place where he's supposed to be, then all the other things fall into place in life. But every young person growing up in a Baptist church is going to face this. Everyone. Because they all have the same old sin nature. I don't care how squeaky clean they look. They all have that same fierce hatred of God somewhere there. It's there. It's an enmity against God. It doesn't like God's holiness. It is not surrendered to God. It doesn't intend to be. It cannot be sanctified. It cannot be reformed. Not in the sense of going to heaven. It must be born again. And I face that. I don't know what I would have done had I been confronted with the emerging church philosophy in those days. 
but also the emerging church is permeated with contemplative mysticism. Contemplative mysticism. And uh, pastors, you need to understand this. I'm not going to spend any time here. But this is sweeping through everything. And it comes out of the Roman Catholic Church and it's demonic and it is a bridge to demonism yes. and to communing with devils. That's right. But it has this veneer of serious spiritual worship. And I believe what it is is lost people that don't find any satisfaction in the, in the real Christian life and in real prayer and, and the real uh, spiritual elements of the Christian life they're empty, so they go into these things. Centering prayer, emptying your mind, using a mantra like Hindus, to go down into the center of yourself and meet God there. Well, Christ in you, the hope of glory, but the Bible never says go down into the center of yourself and meet Christ there. That's right. Amen. Jesus taught us to pray to our Father, which art in heaven, not down here in Amen. your belly. This is damnable. It is so dangerous. We've written books about it. We've uh, dozens and dozens of articles about it to give an information uh, because I have read their books to be able to do that. The Jesus prayer, just saying uh, uh, one little thing over and over again. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me. Lord Jesus Christ, all day long. And so the, this, this is sweeping through and the emerging church loves this. Contemplative mysticism, contemplative prayer. One of the biggest names in it was a Catholic priest, Catholic monk who was also a Buddhist. A Buddhist, Thomas Merton. I've been to the monastery where he lived. They, they, they live in silence. They don't talk most of the time. And uh, yeah, but they write. <laughs> and so he went to Sri Lanka to worship Buddha He's there before for the Buddha shrines, and he said, I don't know when in my life I've had such a sense of beauty and spiritual vitality. And then he went to Bangkok at an interfaith conference and got electrocuted with a fan. Yeah, but he still speaks. His books are extremely influential. The emerging church, what is it? It denies the imminency of the return of Christ. McLaren calls this pop evangelical eschatology and the eschatology of abandonment. He said, we just want to, you, 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 you Bible-believing Christians that believe in the rapture, you just want to abandon the world to its troubles. Mark Driscoll, he called it the pessimistic dispensationalism. He's clever with his words. And, uh, but the Bible most definitely teaches the rapture. And it also teaches us that it's imminent. Amen. Yeah. An imminent rapture is the only way that we could not know the exact timing of the Lord. Right. If we were to watch for the rise of the Antichrist, I was in Israel my third time a month ago, and the rise of the Antichrist, we could see him. We could see that temple being built there that they're preparing to build right now. Everything's ready. Temple Institute, everything's ready. The Temple Institute, the, 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 the woman the representative, last time we went there, we said, how long will it take to build the temple? She said, a few months. And so the temple will be built. You'll be able to see it on, you know, Fox News. And then um, the, the two witnesses will stand there in Jerusalem and, and warn and preach against the Antichrist. He's going to be spitting angry, but he won't be able to do anything for three and a half years. Evangelists, Jewish evangelists will go around the world and preach the God. And so you'll be able to see all those events and say, well, it's three years from now. Well, it's two years right. from now. Right. There's no embassy there. Right. The only thing that will give you an embassy, and I think this is a fundamental, Amen. is that the rapture will occur before that. Because what happens in the book of Revelation, what happens in the Daniel 70th week is not our program. That's a Jewish program. Amen. We have a different program, and we're going to be gone. Amen. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 
Jesus said, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Unexpected, cannot be preceded with those signs. Paul said, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord's at hand. Your hand's not very far away. James, be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Right outside the door. Peter said, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober. And watch the prayer. It's at hand. The imminency. And that was what the early church, churches believed. And the first Christians believed. And they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And to wait for a son from heaven. Just waiting. Right. Amen. The imminent rapture is a great purifier of the Christian life. It's an important doctrine. It encourages a believer in trials and persecutions. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, Wherefore comfort one another with these words, the words about the rapture. It keeps the church's focus on the Great Commission instead of getting stride, sidetracked to social work and kingdom building right. and all of this stuff. D.L. Moody had a lot of, I think, doctrinal problems, but one thing he certainly got right was, I look upon this world as a wrecked vessel. God has given me a lifeboat and said to me, Moody, Save all you can. That's what our business is. What is emerging church? You see, the, it, it, what it is, is they worship a different God, entirely different Bible, different gospel. And this was so evident at that conference. The shack, the author of the shack was there. It had been read by 57% of the attendees. William Young was interviewed by Andy Crouch, the, one of the editors of Christianity Today. See, the shack is all, all about a new type of God, which is all America's about right now. America has rejected the faith of its fathers. Not is being, is not is rejecting, has rejected. In my lifetime, America has rejected the faith of her fathers. The country that I was born into in 1949 no longer exists. You're right. And it's all about changing gods. Yes. The shack. A woman wrote to the author and said that her 22-year-old daughter came to her after reading the book and asked her mother, is it all right if I divorce the old God and marry the new one? She understood the message. The old God is holy and just and has law and justice. And infractions against his law will be punished. Every infraction. Eternal punishment. Because the sinning never stops and the punishment will never stop. And that's what hell is all about, his holiness. And that God is a compassionate God who himself purchased salvation for the world, for those that would believe. But that hell side and that holy side is what America has rejected. And that, that's the side of God that the shack um, uh, rejects. It's a fictional story about a man who's bitter against God because his youngest daughter was murdered, so he's blaming God. She was murdered in a shack out in the woods. So he goes back to the scene of the murder in the, in the novel, and there he has a life-changing experience with God, but not the God of the Bible. The God of the shack. God the Father is depicted as a black woman named Elusia. Elusia. Elousia. Elousia, maybe. And a gray-haired man with a ponytail. The God is cool, loves rock and roll, has the earphones plugged in all the time, does not exercise wrath towards sin, 
does not send unbelievers to an eternal fiery hell, puts no obligations on people, and doesn't like traditional Bible churches. That's the God in this book. That God said, I don't need to punish people for sin. It's not my purpose to punish it. That God says, those that love me come from every system that exists, Buddhists, Mormons, Muslims. I have no desire to make them Christian. That God says, the Bible doesn't teach you to follow rules. <laughs> no, I guess not. Just from beginning to end, that's all. The Bible doesn't teach you to follow rules. In Ephesians 4 through 6, we're talking about a born again child of God under the grace of God. But Ephesians 4 through 6, alone, I counted more than 80 specific rules that believers are to obey under grace. The God of the shack is the God of the emerging church. What did we have here? We have a changing of gods. You can see it, don't you? You can see it all around. You can see it in the churches. It's not just different doctrine. It's a different God. Emerging church is another building stone of the end time Tower of Babel. We've written a large book on the emerging church. What is the emerging church? It's not a simplistic thing. It has many elements. And especially pastors need to understand these things at a good level so they can protect their people. And two other books that are associated with the emerging church that we've published. None of those books are here at this meeting, the New Age Tower of Babel and Contemplative Mysticism, a powerful ecumenical bond.